Um, my career has taken a, a circuitous route, uh, which has surprised me and probably anybody who knew me. Um, I should say that my career here at the University of Minnesota, I, I taught at the University of Minnesota for 38 years, uh, I'm retired now, um, has two very distinct parts. Uh, I started as a cell biologist and an electron microscopist, uh, so in very high-tech um, molecular biology. And mid-career, I had a crisis. The field was changing. Everybody was moving to DNA cloning. I didn't want to do that. And so I was had to sort of reinvent myself. Um, and that was, was when I started working on this textbook that uh, Peter has asked me to talk about. And at the same time, I sort of moved back to an interest that I'd had before. I'd always been interested in nature, nature study, uh, environmental issues uh, since I was a little kid. When I started at graduate school, that was what I intended to do. I was going to be an ecologist or a park naturalist or something like that. And I discovered uh, that there weren't any jobs in those areas. It was a, a period when uh, ecology was in the doldrums. And cell biology had just been invented. And electron microscopes had just been invented. And so that was a very exciting era. And I'm really pleased, I'm really happy that I had a chance to participate in that. It, it, one of the strange things is I assumed when I went into that then and got a PhD um, in cell biology that I'd be doing that for the rest of my life. And it only lasted about 20, about 20 years. And then the field dried up and everybody moved into other areas. Um, and I was thinking about what to do next and I decided I'd go back to environmental science, which had been sort of my original interest. And by that time, this is about 1980, um, there was a renewed interest and there were new opportunities. And uh, about that time, an editor from a little company in Iowa called William C. Brown came by and knocked on my door and said, would you like to write a textbook? And I said, well, I'd, I'd always been interested in writing and had thought I'd like to write something. And a textbook sounded like a, a good idea. Um, in fact, what I really wanted to write, what I had really been dreaming of, was to do a book of nature essays. I, I taught courses, for, well, at least a dozen years um, on nature writing and wilderness literature because I admired, I liked reading and I liked um, some of the nature authors. And um, in particular, I admire Sigurd Olson, who lived up in northern Minnesota all of his life and, and wrote some beautiful books. Um, my favorite of those is called Singing in Wilderness, published by Alfred Knopf. And Elder Leopold, who taught at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who wrote Sand County Almanac. <clears throat> and that was really what I wanted to write. Um, and I tried some essays, and they were terrible. They were just awful. Because up to that point, all of my writing had been scientific journal articles, and they have to be passive-voiced, past perfect tense, third person, lots of qualifiers, long sentences. You don't want to have lots of paragraph breaks because it takes up too much space in a scientific paper and it's perfectly all right to have a whole page uh, with just uh, one paragraph of two or three sentences and you know 500 words in each sentence. So that was the way I was writing essays and I realized they were awful and uh, I really needed some practice writing and so this editor came and knocked on the door and said do you want to do a textbook? And I thought well that would be a good way to get some practice writing. And uh, at least I, I could be fairly sure it would be published. Um, I realized that there are lots of people doing nature essays um, around the United States and that the chances of throwing a manuscript over the transom and getting it published were very slight. And I thought, well, at least somebody will see the textbook if I write it and you know, it might make a little bit of money and it might be an interesting thing to do. So I said, sure, I'll try. Um, and it turned out that it was a fortuitous thing in several ways, both in, in the fact that I was at this juncture in my career where I needed to do something else. Um, and this turned out to be uh, very successful and very enjoyable and very rewarding. Um, 
And it also rejuvenated my career, my teaching career. Um, so I had come to the end, sort of a dead end in cell biology, where I couldn't think of anything I wanted to do anymore. Uh, well, I could think of things I wanted to do, but they wouldn't get funded. So I was trying to think of something that I wanted to do, I knew how to do, and I thought could get funded. I could think of things that fit one or two of those criteria, but not all three. And so I was sort of floundering, and I was tired of teaching cell biology anyway. I'd done it for about 20 years. And uh, I started working on this textbook. And uh, it really gave me a whole new lease on life. I started learning new things, and I got excited about going to the classroom to tell students about the things I just learned, and my teaching improved, and it was it was a, a very a very happy move, as it turned out. I, I didn't realize that it would be. It was sort of unplanned, and I just sort of fell into it. But it turned out to be a good direction to go. This, the way fields happen in biological science is to the outsider pretty strange. I mean, how can cell biology just die? Yeah, it is strange. Um, and it's surprising, but when I look back, I realize a number of other fields have, have done the same thing. They have, and the, the, the life cycle is getting shorter and shorter, especially when they're based on technology. Somebody had warned me about that in grad school. They said, you know, if you base your career on a technology, then when that technology becomes obsolete, you're obsolete too. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't really listen at the time, but um, many of, of many fields have sort of, they, they come and go very quickly these days. Uh, somebody invents a whole new way of doing things, and everybody loses interest in what was being done before, and we're sort of like lemmings rushing off the cliff, cliff, you know, we all rush in that direction to get in on the hot new thing. Um, and um, it, it gets sort of overpopulated and it crashes very quickly. It's, it's, a, it's an odd thing, but it seems to be the way science works these days. And the, the granting agencies feed that. Uh, what happened in my field was some of the leaders, the the you know the hotshots, the big stars in the field, announced there's nothing left to be discovered in this field, and we're leaving it. Um, and there will be no more major discoveries. And the NIH and NSF, which are the granting agencies, said, "Well, if that's the case, we're not going to give any more grants." And the students said, "Well, if there's no grants, there's no money to pursue this, then we're going to move to something else." It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and, and also, these, these people who were the big shots were also on the review panels at NIH and NSF, and they were saying, you know, don't give any money to that, it's not worth it, you know, you ought to put money into this new field that I've just moved into. Uh, so there's a little bit of self-interest, but the effect was the whole field just in a, in a year or two, a couple of years, just sort of fell off a cliff and, and disappeared. This didn't imply, I take it, that we've understood everything there is to know about the human cell or uh, no. cell of biological organisms? No, so. that's right. It, it doesn't. And I'm sure there are things left to discover. But it probably was true that we had discovered all of the major structures um, and that there, there probably wouldn't be a lot of breakthroughs. One of the things that's different about my area and yours, Peter, is that in science there's this belief, there's, there's no interest in history, the history of science. Um, um, and and um, there's, there's this feeling that if, if it's over a year old, it's useless, it's worthless. No, nobody reads literature that's more than a year old. Why would you do that? Because there's a lot of people um, in the field now. Um, to give you an idea of the growth, I went to the very first cell biology meeting of the annual society in 1960, and there were about 100 people there. Uh, and I knew all of them, or at least knew of them. I knew who they were and what, what they were doing. Um, the last meeting I went to was 1980, and there were 25,000 people there, and I didn't know a soul. <laughs> 
Um, and I don't know if they still have meetings. I don't. <laughs> I think. I think. Um, and and so there's, you know, there's a huge number of people, and there's a lot of people working. And you assume that, in anything you want to know about, there's dozens of people working and publishing papers, and whatever they did last year supersedes anything that was done before. So there's there's no use to read old stuff, meaning two or three years old, um, and no use to save articles because they'll be superseded very quickly. And, or, or save data, you know, if you, if you, if you haven't done it um, yesterday, it's, it's not worth much. I mean, the, the pace was tremendously rapid. One of, the, one of the funny stories, I remember going to meetings, uh, and some of these big hot shots, this is in the early days when, when the field was really flourishing and everybody was excited about it, these, and these hot shots were there, and we had meetings in those days that lasted for five or six days, and one of one of the guys got up and gave a lecture about the experiments his lab had just done. The next morning, his competitor got up and said, "Well, my lab ex repeated those experiments last night. I called them from New Hampshire, where we were, and they did. It, and here's the results we got." And the next day, the other guy had a rebuttal. His lab had done more experiments, but you know, it's on a almost a day-to-day -day basis. Things are happening, and advances are being made, and discoveries are being made. And then, uh, when you have that really rapid pace, um, you know nobody reads Socrates and Plato and um, old philosophers. What what would be the use of that? Um, so it was a it was an exciting field, uh, but I'm I'm glad I found another outlet and something else that I like equally well. So it turned out to be a fortuitous change for me. One of my puzzles uh, is if with with research working the way you say, what in some sense is its product? I mean, you want to say, well, new articles, new discoveries, yeah. etc. But is there any mind that understands an organism <laughs> these days I mean, that, that, say, understands the cat? Hmm. Uh, having said, okay, well, well, now we've put this stuff together, we know what a cat is? Or is it all a matter of, I understand that there are these questions left by this last piece of research on the inner ear of a particular sort of cat. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm kind of, a, a, I, I have difficulty understanding kind of what it means for a field to make progress that fragments that much. Um, well, the field certainly is highly specialized and people became more and more specialized in finer and finer details, which actually is one of the reasons I find that I like writing this textbook and being an environmental scientist where it's a very broad discipline and I, I find that I'm really happy being a generalist. Uh -huh. um, much more than I was being so highly specialized. Um, so and part of the answer to your question is it's difficult for any one person now to grasp all of this knowledge that we've gained because there is so much that we know about the body. Um, and about living things, um, but we are finding out more and more. It's hard to it's hard to integrate it. But there are people. So I don't know if any one individual can integrate it all, but collectively we are getting a lot of integration. One of the reasons people rushed away from cell biology was DNA sequencing had become available, and it has turned out to be a very powerful tool, and we're learning a huge amount about which genes do what things. I, I suspect that at some point they're going to have to come back to cell biology, in fact, because they're finding out that these genes control those structures in the cell, the things that were described during my era, and they're, they're going to need to go back and look at them more closely. And, and, and so, Well, I have to say some people are doing that. Um, so.
there's a lot of progress being made in cell and developmental biology, molecular biology, and it is it is getting closer to making sense and to understanding how these systems interact now than than it was um, 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, for a lot of the time when I was working on the structure of cells, we could see the structures, but we had no idea what they did. And it was really very abstract. I mean, it was just, just these interesting patterns and shapes and um, we were doing it just because they were pretty. And with a, with a belief, there was sort of a fundamental belief, they must be important because they're there and it must be worthwhile to understand more about them. Um, but it was very much in isolation for, for most of those years. Uh, why, why are you looking at these things? Well, it turns out now we're discovering more of the functions and many of those things really are important and uh, really are worthwhile. So the, the, field, the field probably will make several circles, you know, coming back to previous knowledge and explaining it and moving on to some new approach to study and then circling back and fitting the pieces together. So, I had this conversation with a medical student, maybe, about how, how far away from your studies you are before you're totally out of date. Where is it in biological sciences these days? Oh, I think it's very, very short time. A year or two. So, so you wouldn't you, you wouldn't trust somebody who'd been away from the literature for a year. Yeah. Um, if and if I were to try to start over, I'd be starting very much at the beginning to try to understand what's what's being done now and mm -hmm. what the current theories are and understandings. Now, what is the, the place of the textbook author in the kind of ecology of biological science? I mean, presumably, there are all these folks out there doing specialized work. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to orient the newcomers mm -hmm. um, in an intelligible way. Um, so, so, kind of, how do you see your role with respect to this mass of research that's going on, and 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 the responsibility of the kind of text you write? Um, so, textbooks are training for students. Clearly, um, they're they're not of much interest to the researchers. Even even the journals are not very useful for the researchers because it takes too long for journals to get published. And so the people who are really at the cutting edge of research learn from each other through meetings and travel and sort of personal contacts and email these days. And so the textbook is, is trying to capture the essence of this information, this field of body of knowledge, and make it intelligible, as you say, for, for students so they can get up to speed. Um, and it's really hard to do in uh, a field like cell biology or molecular biology or, uh, because it is changing so rapidly. Uh, and there are so many facets. Uh, I thought briefly about trying to do a cell biology textbook when I was contemplating um, doing some writing and decided it was too hard to keep up to date. Um, and although there's, there's a lot of change also in the many different environmental um, areas that I write about in my current text, I'm not trying to be at the cutting edge of research in any of those. So the environmental science text is a much broader, <clears throat> much more general kind of textbook. And I don't struggle to stay up to date on all the technical details, which makes it a lot, a lot easier to do. Um, so, tech, but textbooks, 
do have a certain responsibility in that they're explaining this world of knowledge to beginning students. And there are sort of fads in textbooks as there are fads in the underlying science and how you explain things and what they mean. And there's, there's a certain struggle between various authors um, in what to tell students, what, what it is that you're, you're representing to them. In, in my field of environmental science as well as in all the other, text, all the other fields, in, in many fields, um, there is one textbook that sets the tone, that kind of dominates the field and, and determines um, what it is that people learn about, what, what this field means. Um, is, is, and all the others kind of follow after and model themselves on, on that one. Every once in a while somebody decides that that book, the leading book, whatever it is, isn't doing it right and tries to mount a revolution, a, a paradigm shift. Um, and Occasionally one of those is successful, uh, often they're not. In, in fact, well, maybe this is time to get into why I started writing this environmental science book and why I thought there was a, a need for a new one. Um, it was true in the field of environmental science. There was a book written by a guy named G. Tyler Miller, who was from North Carolina, that had dominated environmental science for a dozen years or more when I was thinking about getting started. And um, it, it had, he had very good coverage of ecology, sort of basic ecology, and a good description of air and water pollution. Um, and when this editor from William C. Brown came around and knocked on my door and said, do you want to write a textbook? And, if, if, and I, I said, well, I thought about cell biology, but I, I don't think I could keep up to date with it. Well, the, the main reason was the, the big dogs in the field had written, had gotten together and had written the definitive book, which is still the definitive book in that field. And I not only didn't think I could keep up to date with them, but I didn't think I'd have any hope of competing. And I said, he said, well, what else do you teach? I said, well, I, I teach environmental science, and I really enjoy that course. He said, well, if you were to write an environmental science book, what would you do? Why, why do you think there's room for a new one? And I said, well, the existing book takes the attitude, people are no damn good. There's too many people. People are the cause of all the problems. Um, we just have to get rid of most of the people on the earth, and then everything would be wonderful. Uh, it's very Malthusian, if your viewers know that term, Malthus wrote a book in 1795 saying essentially that, that uh, there aren't enough resources to go around, uh, there never will be, that there will always be competition and uh, that uh, people will always reproduce as much as they possibly can and that will stretch the resources and then there will be warfare and famine and disease and it's inevitable. In fact, Malthus uh, was trained as a Anglican minister, but he never practiced. <clears throat> he was mostly an economist and is credited with being the reason they call economics the dismal science, because he had this very dismal view of the world. And that was what I perceived my competitor Miller had in his book, that this attitude that nature is perfect if we just leave it alone, but that everything we do messes it up and that there's no hope for progress. And um, I wanted to add what I've come to think of as sort of the human dimensions of environmental science. Um, I wanted to add chapters on environmental health, environmental ethics, economics, urban planning, uh, policy, um, policy and law. Um, so I, I wanted to go beyond just this sort of scientific basis and talk about not only what are we doing to nature, but why are we doing it and what could we do about it. Uh, I've just recently added a chapter on restoration, how we can sort of repair damage, which I think is a, an important aspect. Um, so the editor said, well, go ahead and you know, we'll try and review it. You know, you write some chapters and we'll send it out for review. And um, at first there was a lot of resistance to this. 
trying to add these new features. Part of it was that professors weren't used to teaching these, these areas and didn't want to add them to their courses. It meant they had to learn some new material and had to change their course syllabus and all. Uh, and there, there were a lot of professors apparently who just didn't want to discuss the human aspects, human dimensions. A lot of, I think a lot of people were extremely loyal to Miller and uh, thought he was right, um, that you know, people are no good and that the, the, cause, the, base, the cause of all of our environmental problems and maybe the cause of all problems is just too many people. Um, I don't know if you recall there was a philosopher, bio, biologist philosopher named Garrett Hardin who wrote a book about lifeboat, both lifeboat ethics. He said, there aren't enough resources to go around. It's like we're in a lifeboat um, and there are people all around us calling for help. If we take pity on them and pull them in, then our lifeboat sinks and we're all, it's com complete uh, equity but complete disaster. And that it's too bad for all those people, but we ought to be sending them bombs, not, not aid. Um, and that was, that was a very popular essay, um, especially among biologists uh, at the time. So um, one of the things that's most satisfying about having written this textbook and having it become successful, the editor just told, told us uh, yesterday that we're number one in the field now. It's the, it's the top selling environmental science book in America. Um, so we've, we've supplanted Miller. But when I started writing, Miller uh, sold something like f over half of the books of env environmental science every year in America. And so my, my aspiration was, I thought, well, I'll never compete directly with Miller. I'll never get into that category. But there were five or six other books that shared like the other 40%. And I thought, if I could get into that second tier, um, that would be very satisfying, you know. Um, well, about six or eight years ago, we passed Miller, and now we're selling about two-thirds of the books, and Miller is selling, he's in the second tier, selling, he's, he's with five or six other books, uh, selling the other, the other third. So, I don't know how much of this new material that I've added is actually being used, but professors are buying the books or asking their students to buy them and students have access to it. You never know whether they read, whether they read it or not, but um, most of the students now are being exposed to the idea that humans are part of the ecosystem. Uh, we're part of the problem, but we can also be part of the solution and that technological progress is possible. Um, that we can restore, re repair the damage we've done, and uh, there is hope for the future to, uh, to do something about, about our environment to improve it. So I, I'm very pleased that um, we've made that transition successfully. Well, are, are you in agreement with the view that there are far too many people? No, I'm not. Say a little bit more about that. Um, obviously, the world is a finite place, and we can't continue to have exponential growth. You know, where we double every ten years or so um, forever. Um, but um, we can we can make a lot of progress uh, in terms of of extending our resources, reusing materials finding uh, less damaging ways to do things. So, so Malthus thought the world was overpopulated in 1795 when there was less than a billion people. Uh, Garrett Hardin thought that the world was overpopulated in 1950 when there was three or four billion people. Uh, in fact, there were people just reading bumper stickers saying Malthus was right, we have to go back to less than a billion. Well, there's now uh, six or seven billion people and life is much better than it was in 1795. Uh, we have more food to eat, we have better nutrition, better health care, better sanitation, nicer houses, more convenient transportation. 
um, we still haven't reached a level where we're sus completely sustainable and we're still doing damage to our environment. But um, I think the world could accommodate, well, certainly the present population, seven or billion or so. The UN predicts that we'll probably grow to nine billion or nine and a half. And I think we could sustain that many people if we're we make the transition to solar and wind energy, and, um, stop polluting rivers and lakes um, and polluting the air. So I think there are ways that we could, we could have a larger population and that the solution uh, to population problems isn't to drop bombs on people in rapidly growing countries, um, but to understand what the, what the driving forces are. Um, one of the things that I introduced that had not been discussed in environmental science books before I started writing was the idea of the relation between poverty and population growth and environmental degradation. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't original to me. I, I was writing in an era uh, just after uh, the first Earth Summit in, in Stockholm in 1972 and the Brundtland Commission came out while the report came out called Our Common Future. It was a wonderful book that came out just as I was working on my text. And I was really influenced by those UN reports that were saying that uh, the poor people of the world are both the agents of degradation, environmental degradation, but also the victims of it. Um, that the reason they're cutting down the trees in the forest and the reason they're overgrazing the, the rangelands is not because they don't care or because they're they're greedy, but because they have no other option. Uh, that they'd have better sanitation and they they'd live in more sustainable ways if they could, if they had had the opportunity to do so. Um, and that poverty reduction and more equi equitable distribution of resources and access to resources is really the solution to many of the environmental problems that. Uh, people will see that it's in their interest to do things in a better way if they can, if they have the option. Uh, but so many people in the world are living sort of at the edge of survival. They, they can't look forward very much beyond tomorrow because they just need to get food and shelter for today uh, to survive. And, and so they don't have the option of considering uh, more sustainable ways of doing things, but they will. Um, if, if they're given more opportunity. And the most encouraging thing is that population growth is slowing almost every place in the world. Uh, as we have better development, as incomes rise, as people can see that their children are going to survive childhood, uh, they do choose to have fewer children. And uh, so we're going through what's called a demographic transition. And so growth is slowing every place um, and it's coming about much more rapidly than many people thought was possible and it's coming about without draconian laws that say you can't have children you know um, people will choose to do this and, oh, and, and it's also possible at much lower levels of income so um, there was this argument <clears throat> um, of 20 years ago or so. Well, sure, population growth had slowed at that point in America and in most of Northern Europe, but that was because we had, we were rich countries, you know, we had a very high level of income. And, and the critics were saying, well, it's not possible for all of the large countries in the developing world to reach the same level of affluence that we have that we enjoy, and so probably they're never going to stabilize their population. Well, we're discovering that in, in many places um, it isn't necessary to be as rich as we are, uh, to have um, good health care, um, good education, um, livable housing, good food, and and for people to realize that they don't need to have six or seven or eight children in order to have some survive to take care of them in their old age. That 
Um, a lot of countries are stabilizing their growth with one-tenth the income, annual income per capita that the U.S. has. Um, and in, in many ways, um, achieving a high standard of living, a high quality of life, um, without having to have uh, as much per capita income as we do. So I think there's an encouraging story there. And I think it means that, um, I, you know, I hope we don't grow to 10 or 12 or 15 billion people. I think that makes a lot of problems much harder. Um, but I think that we don't need to worry nearly so much about population. And we don't need to blame um, problems and issues on population as the, as the only cause, as people once did. I want to ask you about another contributor to the pessimistic scenario, at least as I've heard it. And I, I get my economics in comic book form, you understand, and then I purvey these comic book ideas and people who know things tell me how to correct them. And one piece of the comic book on environmental degradation that I have in my head has the story you're telling just now about poverty and environmental degradation. If you're, if you're cold enough, you burn the tree you know you yeah. shouldn't burn because yeah. you're cold. If you're hungry enough, you eat the endangered species because yeah. if it's, if yeah. it's the only thing to eat. But the other story I have in my head is that as the world becomes one marketplace, it encourages that movement encourages farmers everywhere to grow whatever it is they can grow best. That is, it pushes in the direction of a sort of monoculture agriculture or something like that. The, the great fields of corn and soybeans and no wheat and no sugar beets and no potatoes that you see in you know, most directions going out from this mm -hmm. place. And my, my sort of comic book understanding is that that is in various ways degrading to the environment and that that's a huge movement in the, direct, in, in the direction of accelerating all sorts of changes that it's going to be that are that are importantly bad or importantly disruptive. Yes, uh, that's true. Um, it, I think you're absolutely right that the move towards large-scale industrial monoculture agriculture has been very bad for the environment and bad for local communities in many ways, um, and that globalization makes it possible for farmers to only grow soybeans in southern Minnesota and then ship them to India and China and all over. Um, so in a sense globalization makes export, commodity export, easier and more feasible. On the other hand, globalization also spreads information. Um, it makes it much easier for everybody to understand what the effects on our environment are. Um, and for information to flow, as well as commodities. And there's a very strong movement now in the U.S. and in Europe and in Australia New Zealand and maybe even spreading to other developing countries to understand that having diversified agriculture helps support diversified communities and it's better for the environment. And uh, that you should eat locally grown food as much as possible. Uh, a term is beginning to be used here, <clears throat> we're locavores, we're not uh, carnivores or, or uh, um, other kinds of specialties, but it's important to be a locavore and eat locally, eat local food. Um, 
and we we understand we have more choices in what we buy. Um, at a time when we didn't know much about other countries or where the food came from, we had no idea uh, how it got to our table. We didn't know whether it mattered uh, what we bought. Um, then, then we just bought whatever, whatever was cheapest and uh, whatever was on the shelves in the grocery store. And we didn't think to ask where, what's the origin, how was it produced, um, who, who worked under what conditions on, on growing this food. Um, now we know we can ask those questions. Um, and the people in the underprivileged part of the world can ask, you know, how much is this food selling for in America? Mm. I'm, you know, I'm working for a few pesos a day, and they're selling this stuff at ten dollars a pound in America. Is is that fair? Um, so that I think I think that movement towards industrial agriculture um, may shift, may shift back towards varieties of food that are um, that have evolved or have adapted to local conditions and uh, are locally grown and have cultural associations. And another thing that's probably going to shift away from huge commodity exports is the cost of fuel. Um, I'm, I'm reading that it's already having an effect um, that um, you can't afford to grow soybeans in Minnesota and ship them to China to grow pigs that are then shipped back to America, it's just too expensive that um, we're, go we're going to grow more of the food for local consumption just because of transportation costs. And I think that may be a good thing. Now, if we can avoid kind of this incredible artificial subsidy on, yes. on, on, on fossil fuels, mm -hmm. um, one other piece of the pessimistic picture I have is the sense that barriers are very important biologically. That it's very important that things don't move very much geographically, or that they move very slowly. Partly because if organisms move fast, they're going to get into some place that hasn't adapted anything to keep them under control, yeah. and they will mess up wherever they go. Yeah. That, whether it's a germ-resistant bacterium someplace in the middle of the Brazil jungle, or a, you know, a, a, you know an antibiotic-resistant bacterium sitting there uh, behaving itself, not knowing that it happens to carry just what you need to avoid, you know, the latest thing we've come to, to knock out strep, or whether it's some little fish that's just a little fish because it's got something to eat it, that then finds its way into the Great Lakes where it doesn't have anything to eat it and turns into the major population of the Great Lake. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I mean, the other piece of the pessimistic story is organisms are moving so fast they are. that all of the mischief, pretty much all of the mischief that can be done is getting done with incredible speed. It, it is a huge problem. Um, we call them invasive species. Uh, of course, a lot of things uh, get transported in ships and planes and boats and, uh, and get to a new place and don't survive. Um, not everything is moving all the time, but there have been lots and lots of cases where species that, as you say, were mild-mannered where where they lived originally 
get transported and released and they don't have any predators, they don't have any any control over the population. They find a new niche where they can thrive and take over and crowd out all the existing species and 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 it's homogenizing the world so that where we had lots of diversity and we had organisms that were exquisitely adapted, evolved for a particular place, a particular biological community are suddenly pushed out. And one of the big, biggest worries is that we're losing those unique adaptations and we're losing all the genetic variation and genes that might turn out to be very useful to us uh, uh, are disappearing because those native species are being driven extinct. Um, as well as just the aesthetic and and religious implications, you know, it turns out a lot of very conservative fundamentalist religious people are really concerned about this because they believe God created the world with all of its diversity and all of its specialization, and that we shouldn't be destroying thousands, maybe even millions of species and just letting them go extinct and um, crowding them out by introducing all kinds of new competitors and new diseases and new problems. Um, and so I guess not only um, for religious purposes, but people who just believe the world is beautiful and interesting, having a lot of diversity, are sad to see this go. We could probably survive in a world that only has dandelions and and house sparrows and you know um, glossy buckthorn and a few dominant invasive species, um, but it would be a much poorer place. And it um, there there are a huge number of these problems, and they're spreading. And by the way, I don't know that everybody knows that. We hear about invasive species that have come into the U.S. Um, and are crowding out our native species, but it isn't so widely known, perhaps, <clears throat> that we have exported species to other places as well. Um, the Black Sea used to be a very productive fishery um, um, and the, and, and so so was the Caspian Sea. The Caspian Sea, I think this is the story. There's a, a invertebrate, a, kind of a, a comb jelly. It looks like jellyfish, but it's a slightly different uh, taxonomic group. But it now is 90% of the biomass. I can't remember what it's the black sea. I think it's the Caspian Sea. Um, and it has crowded out all of the fish. And, uh, it's eating up all the young fish and the fish eggs, and it came from America. So, so we're exporting our species other places as well, and it's it's part of this globalization. It's part of, partly because of all the transportation. Well, so there again, at least we now know more about this. I mean, there was an era in America where people were deliberately doing this. They were deliberately and the reason we have English sparrows or house sparrows is that somebody had this um, um, project to bring over to America all the birds that Shakespeare mentioned. And so they, they deliberately brought over birds and released them in Central Park in New York. Um, and starlings were another example. Um, and it went to great expense, in fact, to try, try to introduce all these things from Europe. It's turned out in many cases to be a disaster that they shouldn't have done it well. So now at least we know more about we, we need to try to control these things. Um, we, we sort of let the cat out of the bag in a sense in many cases. It's going to be really hard to reverse um, those invasions. <clears throat> but um, at least countries are making an effort to control this. Excuse me, I'm going to take a drink. <clears throat>
I just saw in a, in a paper this morning a new example. There's a fish called the red lionfish. It has poisonous spines. It was um, an inhabitant of Africa, and it's now spreading all along the U.S. coast, and it's gobbling up little fish, and it it's, um, has poisonous spines, and it's bad for swimmers and and scuba divers, and um, they think somebody must have dumped some out of an aquarium and introduced it, and it's become a new scourge. Well, it's sounding to me as if the foundation of the optimism that marks your textbook and your outlook is in the fact that, that information about the environment is, is, is spreading and people are taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm understanding you to say that you have some hope that that, that information will be, take, will be understood and taken to heart fast enough yes. to prevent the, at least a certain level of disaster. Yeah. Sort of guarded optimism. And, and in some senses sort of a willful optimism. If we, don't, if we don't take an optimistic outlook and say progress is possible and we can um, um, remedy some of these problems, then it seems like the other alternative is just throw up our hands and say, well, why are we living? Uh, so you, you, um, it's somewhat deliberate. Um, I realize there are lots of problems and they're very serious and very daunting, um, but you have to have to believe that that it's worth trying in order to get people to to do something. Um, and and we have we've made we have made progress in many areas, and I think it's important to keep reminding people of that, reminding ourselves of that. You know that um, life is considerably more comfortable and and more secure now than it was for my father. Um, and I hope it's going to continue to improve for my grandchildren. Um, I guess the, the, the way it's come to me is I've, I'm reading about this little car got introduced into India, mm -hmm. an affordable car, yeah. and thinking, you know, back when my dad encountered the first, his first affordable car, mm -hmm. which wasn't so awfully long after the first affordable car rolled off the assembly line, the romance of that was just unbeatable. Yes. Um, although he resisted it because he liked horses, he yeah. ended up not actually holding on to his horses after tractors were clearly the right way to go, just because he liked horses. Yeah. But all of these countries are coming to affluence and the natural and easy way for them to develop is to, de is to become romantically involved with these disastrous technologies. Yeah. It's, it's a worry. that It's the Tatra. It costs $2,500 in India. Um, and there are literally hundreds of millions of people in India who could afford a $2,500 car. They couldn't afford a $20,000 car. Uh, I've heard some, some amazing stories about people go in and and buy one of these little Tatras and then realize they have never driven in their life. They, they don't know how to drive. And nobody in the family knows how to drive. How are they going to get it home? And so they're unleashing on the highways just hordes of people who have no idea um, how to drive. And, and there's a huge worry that um, they're going to consume an enormous amount of gasoline, burn it, produce CO2, 
warm the climate, um, um, it could lead to a, a huge increase in global climate change. Uh, could be a terrible thing. On the other hand, it represents um, a lot of freedom for Indians who didn't have the opportunity to have transportation before. It could lead to you know being able to, to get jobs in in places they couldn't travel to before and increase their their income and their standard of living. And um, hopefully we're going to make a transition very soon uh, to electric cars. Um, there, there's enough wind and solar power in, in the world. It's thousands of times more than we're currently consuming using fossil fuels. And so it could be that Indians will learn how to drive and, and improve their standard of living and improve their incomes and, and uh, and they'll only drive these Tatras for a few years and then if, if we're successful in moving to an electric car then they'll electrify them and have a little car but instead of a gas, gasoline burning engine it'll be an electric car and they'll hopefully generate that electricity with wind or solar or hydro or something renewable or geothermal or um, and so then they'll have the benefits that we've enjoyed from having easy, convenient, uh, personal transportation, but in an environmentally disastrous mode, to having that same easy, convenient, personal transportation, but based on renewable energy rather than fossil fuel, and we could have the best of both worlds, perhaps. I, I hope so. I mean, I really, I really hope that we're going to move uh, very soon to, to renewable energy. I don't know if you, if you heard Al Gore gave this speech a couple of weeks ago that I thought was a brilliant, where he said, he's challenging America, we could produce 100% of our electricity with renewable um, energy in 10 years. And he said it's doable, um, it, it, would not, it wouldn't harm our economy, it would actually build the economy, there'd be jobs, good, good paying, green collar jobs. And um, I hope we can do it. And both of the current candidates have said they agree with him. John McCain said, if Al Gore says it's doable, I believe it's doable. And Barack Obama said essentially the same thing. He, he, he agreed with Al. So if we do that, um, then the Indians will say, hey, you know, oil is getting is expensive, and, and there's a limited supply, and it's getting more expensive. Let's switch to renewable energy also.